Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise the Lord, amen. You may be seated here tonight, amen, in the presence of the Lord. Amen, I feel the presence of the Lord, and that's, that's what counts, amen. We can feel the Lord here, amen. Praise God. Um, just a couple announcements coming up before we take the uh, offering or receive the offering. Uh, June 7th, the uh, men's conference here at the church will be at 7 at night. And then on the 8th, we have it in the morning here. June 9th, coming up, Friend Day. Okay, and we're going to have, I believe we're going to have burgers and dogs for that and cook them and try to do some activities outside. We'll keep you up. Plan it. We'll keep you informed on that. June 15th, if you're going to camp, please get your camp balance in. And we'd like to see some more people signing up for camp, so if you haven't done that, please put your application in. Amen. Get that to Brother Matt. June 16th, Father's Day. There's no evening service because we're letting people have time with their families, and we will be away on the way to General Conference that week. Amen. And then June 17th through 21, the GMC. August 12th through 16, our camp meeting. Amen. Praise God. And again, we hope you're planning on that. Josh Wilson is going to be our speaker. A great, great guy and a very inspirational person. Amen. We ask Brother Stephen to come and pray and help us receive an offering here tonight. Amen. Thank you, brother. Hallelujah. Lord God, I want to thank you for this time in your presence. Lord, that we might seek you and learn of you. As we bring these tithes and these offerings to your storehouse, pray that you bless it and sanctify it, Lord, that this gospel message might be spread. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you. And we're continuing tonight, once Brother Stephen is by, on, on holiness and our attitudes, okay? And we started that last week, or the second session we had. The three dots up, the, up on the upper right. Hit the three dots, and it'll give you full screen, okay? And go to full screen, yeah, there we go, all right. Now our arrow keys, I don't think that works. You have to use arrow keys or you have to use the mouse roll, roller button. So, amen. So let's read these scriptures here tonight. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. And then Galatians 5, 18 through 23. And a actually with Ephesians, okay, I'd like to back up to verse 29, okay, so we're going to read verses 29 through 32. I feel like it gives us a better context, and again, this is holiness in our attitude, uh, section 3, or lesson 3. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Then Galatians 5, 18 through 23. And Galatians 5 and 18 says, If ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Some, some translations would just say spiritual impurity or spiritual immorality for those first two there. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, could be jealousy. Wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such the like, of which I tell you before, as I have told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom 
of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Amen. So holiness and the Christian attitude. And we, we covered this first slide here last week, but just to give us a better continuity and context, it says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you. With all malice, be ye kind one to another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven us. So a proper attitude toward God and our fellow man will result in manifesting outward holiness. Do you know that if our, if our churches today were transported back into the past, most of those Christians would be kind of, you guys aren't Christians. You realize that? Because of our standards and the things we allow in our lives. We, we, we've, a lot of us, we've absorbed what's coming into society around us and we think it's okay. But we don't realize that a lot of things that we allow today were not allowed in the early church. Amen. So no amount of outer holiness will comp compensate for a lack of inner man. Right? right? So, I mean, we can look right on the outside, but, but if we're not right on the inside, then, then it doesn't work with God. Incorrect attitudes are often the first sign of Backsliding. Okay, what do we mean by attitudes? Our commitment to God. Is God first? Or is God just something we've added on to our life? Is it just a set of morals that we like? I mean, there are a lot of people that go to church and they believe in Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection. They believe in sin and hell. But really all they've done is this, this is a moral system that I like because it came from God. But Going, being a Christian is more than just adding a moral system to your life. You believe that? You must be born again. Incorrect attitudes often lead, will lead to hypocrisy, and attitudes can keep us out of heaven, as we read in Galatians 5, 18 through 21. Those were some attitudes that we want to get out of our life. So in Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, it says, put away these, let all bitterness, gives a list there. So bitterness is something sharp, disagreeable, distasteful, harsh, severe, resentful, vehement, right? Produces piercing remarks and unpleasant language. So bitterness, if it's allowed to fester and, and grow and, sit and be inside of us, our speech eventually will will reveal that. It will show that. Maybe not in all situations, but in certain circumstances, it may come out because of bitterness and of certain attitudes or circum situations. Putting aside spirituality to vent bitterness is not holy. So if I find myself saying bitter words, I know I need to go pray. I know, and, and I don't just need prayer. I need an attitude change. And I need God to show me what it is in me that's producing that bitterness. And what do I need to do to get that out of my life? So even if I'm a leader, even as a leader, leaders should not rebuke with an attitude of harshness. Okay, so we're talking about bitterness. Now we're talking about wrath. Wrath is violent anger. Rage or indignation. And the word suggests a desire to avenge or to punish. And even if we are correct in principle, if we become violently angry, we are wrong for that reason. All right? It's important. Okay? We notice that, that Jesus would always respond the right way, wouldn't he? So we, we control wrath. How do we deal with it? We control wrath through seeking God and prayer. Again, to get these things out of us, and, and it says, the verses we read said, let it be put away. 
right? And as we've said before, when, it, when the Bible says put away, that means God's not automatically removing it from us. He's expecting us to seek him to help remove it from us, all right? So there's a few things the Bible says put off, a few things says put on. Attitudes we're talking about, not clothes, but attitudes. Put off certain attitudes, put on certain things, put on the new man in the same chapter of Ephesians. If you back up, verse 23, be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness, true holiness. So again, there's some things that we have to seek God for. God wants us. God expects those in our lives. But I've got to go to God and ask, put myself before the Lord and say, you need to help me. You need to clear this out of me. I need a mind change. Amen. Now, I, again, I don't know about you, but that causes me to realize I need a prayer life. I need a consistent prayer life. And by prayer life, I don't just mean rep rep repetition of prayers, but I mean actually talking to God and laying myself before the Lord. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. The fact that those words are there means I can get a bad spirit. Amen. I can have a wrong attitude. And because I'm in my humanity, I've got to go to God and be renewed in his way of thinking. Amen. So again, we're talking about anger, a feeling of extreme displeasure that usually results from injury, fear, opposition, and frustration should be up there. Usually those are the key things. You know, if, if you've been, something's happened to you that's caused you great pain and something starts to happen that looks like it's going to repeat that pain, that will cause fear in a person. And they may react in a way that they don't even want to react, but it might be an automatic reaction. That's fear, okay, fear because of things that have happened, okay, from injury. If you've got an injury, a physical injury, and it's very sensitive, if somebody gets on, you broke your arm and your arm is sensitive, you know, and somebody gets around it, you might reflex or position yourself in a way that, they can't touch that arm because it's been hurt, okay? Same thing happens emotionally and spiritually. You realize that many people are coming to the church and positioning themselves, all right, spiritually and emotionally because they've got things that they haven't dealt with. They have not given them to the Lord. They have not let the Lord have his way, okay? Now, again, Let's back up to Galatians there. We read that little passage there. We read verses 5, chapter 5, 18 through 23. And it gave a whole list. It says, now the works of the flesh are manifest, and these are, which are these? He gives a list. Paul's writing to the church, isn't he? Is Galatians written to the church? Or is it written to, you know, everybody in Galatia? It's written to the church in Galatia, isn't it? The churches. So when he gets down to the end of the list, he says, I've told you in times past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, there's attitudes that if I don't get them out of me, I can lose out with God. You see what I'm saying there? There are attitudes. The idea of once saved, always saved is not a biblical idea. God saves us, and God is able to keep us. But, but, I've got to cooperate with God. This is what a lot of the Old Testament is trying to teach us by the stories that are in there. In order to obtain from God, you've got to cooperate and do things the way that God says to do them. Amen. So the moving of the Spirit. I mean, again, Abraham's got to do what God says. Moses has got to do what God says. The children of Israel 
have got to do what God says and put the lamb's blood on the two side posts and over the over the heads the top of the or the lintel. They got to put the blood in those places if they want the angel of death to pass over their house. So we've got to understand there's things we must do. And just because we got saved doesn't mean we are all set. We've got to put ourselves into the hands of the Lord. Go to, to take a, a, pro, a familiar scripture, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And we go praise God, and that is right, praise God. God can work out all things. But the next verse says, and for them whom he did predestinate, foreknow he did predestinate to be conformed to the Son of the Son. Okay? So what is it saying? His purpose is we become conformed to him. So if I want all things to work together, not only do I need to love God, I need to start letting God conform me to his image. That's why we're talking about holiness. Amen. God is holy, right? God is holy. Amen. So anger that is not dealt with usually manifests as lashing out at someone or something. Controlled anger can be productive and unsinful. Not all anger is sinful, but we have to understand, you know, what's, what's the source of it. Okay, a couple examples, such as Jesus, Matthew 21, 12 and 13. So Matthew 21, 12, 13, And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And he said, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but have been made it a den of thieves. Do you think he was smiling when he did it? You think he was, he was angry, right? He was angry when he saw what people were making the house of God into. But his anger was righteous anger. Amen? Praise God. Another one in Mark 3 and 5. And when he had looked around about them with anger, it says anger, being grieved for their hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, stretch forth thy hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole. Amen. And so here we, he is in the synagogue and he sees this man that needs healing that has faith to believe for it. And he asks them, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day or not? Because they had, they had taken the law of not doing work on the Sabbath to the extreme so that now you couldn't heal somebody. Couldn't have a healing. And so Jesus looks around in anger because he knows they're going to judge him. And really he's going to say, is it more lawful to do good on the, on the Sabbath day or bad? To heal or not to heal? Okay, and so again we're showing these are examples of righteous anger. We're trying to say that not all anger is wrong, but we do need to bring ourselves under the Spirit of God and understand the sources of anger in our lives. Amen? So anger that causes us to harm someone in word or deed is wrong. Anger that we carry in our heart and nurse into a grudge is wrong. Again, you hear stories about people in large churches that sit on the opposite sides and, and they kind of keep an eye on, on, on certain people on the other side and if they come to their side, they move around because they haven't resolved their issues between each other. That's wrong. They're not right with God. If, if, if you go into church and there's somebody that you can't love and you can't shake their hand and be nice to them, there's a problem. You can't sit in the same pew with somebody, there's a problem. Amen? All right? Look at Matthew 5 and 22, so we see how, how, what Jesus 
says, says about it. He says, but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, which means you don't have any intelligence, basically, you're empty-headed, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, in other words, meaning you're morally bankrupt and not worth anything, thou shalt be in danger of hell fire. So we have to be careful, don't we? We have to be careful. And so we don't want anger to become a sin. And so Ephesians 4, 26, 27 gives us some guidelines or some instruction. And Ephesians 4, 26 says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Anger not dealt with gives the devil an opportunity. Anger that's not dealt with God's way provides a foothold for the devil. So it says, be ye angry and sin not. It says, it's okay to be angry, but just make sure your anger doesn't lead you to sin. And if you've got anger, deal with it before you go to bed. Now, sometimes it's not possible to talk to the other party before you go to bed, but you can resolve it within yourself and between you and God before you go to bed. You can pray and sort it out and make sure that at least you understand where you're at with God concerning that, and then you need to resolve it with the other party or parties that are involved. But it's saying don't go to bed. Don't go to bed with your fists clenched. Don't go to bed with their, when I get them, I'm going to give it to them. If I get an opportunity, don't go to bed that way. Pray to God to get that resolved. Amen? We're talking about anger here. Clamor. It says put away clamor. This means noisy shouting, outcry, uproar, or insistent demands. And, and it means like the tumult of a controversy. So it's a controversy that has gone beyond just words, but emotions have entered into the situation. You live, most everybody here has lived long enough that you meet some people that they constantly complain. And complaining is their way of getting what they want. Okay, rather than addressing the problem, they complain. They're, they're, they can find this and this and this and this and this wrong. Amen. But they don't, oftentimes don't have a solution. God doesn't want complainers, does he? Now you can take your complaint to God, but I mean, after you take it to the Lord, the Lord's either going to say, leave it to me. <laughs> you need to change something or leave it to me, but you still need to change something. Okay, but... Maybe try to find something good rather than always complaining. Now, we're not saying that, we, that you should never raise an issue because sometimes we need to raise an issue to straighten things out. We're not talking about that, but we're talking about the attitude that this is wrong, that's wrong, this is wrong, and why don't you do it this way? How, how come you didn't do it that way? And, and, and it's just because it's not your way. Sometimes we need to step back and look at it. Well, maybe they didn't do it our way, but did it work? Did it accomplish what needed to be accomplished? If it did, that's fine. doesn't need to be our way, does it? Amen. Some adults throw temper tantrums. You got people who keep the church in an uproar by demanding attention or presenting demands, and they're, they're guilty of clamor. All right, so we don't, want, we don't want to be involved in that. And you can say, well, I don't know about that, but the Bible says put it away, so it must have happened. Right? It must, somebody must have been doing it. Right? It's human, okay? Evil speaking. Evil speaking comes from an evil heart and is often rooted in jealousy. 
And jealousy a lot of times is rooted in insecurity. All right? We're jealous of them because we, we would like that. They've accomplished it. But we don't feel like we got a fair shake or, or we could accomplish that. Listen, you go to God. If God wants you to have that, God's going to give it to you. But you need to do what you need to do to have it. And don't worry about what you don't have. Be thankful for what you do have. Amen? So the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So when evil things come out, when words come out of us, what comes out of our mouth is really the result of what is in our heart. So, you know, if we've got suppressed anger or suppressed fear, different things that are there, then it comes out. We do our best to c control it, but it's, it's almost like that soda that got shake, shooken, shaken up. You put your hand on it, but when you move it, it's going to fizz. It's going to go. And so sometimes life will shake us up. Amen. Do we allow ourselves to speak evil of others? I think we were talking about this at the men's meeting, okay? We were talking about it. And I, and I was relating that when I worked for Foxborough, one of the guys I work with, he, he said that this is what they said at church, and I liked it. He said, when there's a problem, he says, if you're not part of the problem or part of the solution, you shouldn't be talking about it. And I've always remembered, I said, that makes a lot of sense. That's a good rule, okay? If I'm not part of the problem, if I am, I need to be involved in it. But if I'm not part of it and I don't have a fix, let me just keep my mouth quiet. I don't need to broadcast it all over the place. Amen? Hallelujah. Do we trouble, cause trouble by our speech or disunity? See, disunity weakens the move of God in the spirit. That's why the devil wants to, if he can't keep people out of church, then he wants to keep them disunified. That's the next thing. If he can't keep you out of church, he tries to cause disunity because when there's disunity, the spirit of God does not flow. Okay, so disunity means it's not unified. So if my arm's over there, my other arm's over there, and my leg is in the back, and the head is up there, then, then the body doesn't work. But when we're unified, we're all connected. And we're connected by the Spirit. Amen? Praise God. So again, now, now the attitude of malice. Malice means active ill will, a desire to hurt others. So a person that's got malice often takes pleasure in hurting or seeing others suffer. And usually it's the result of hatred that hasn't been dealt with, and then now it's, it's kind of fermented, and now it becomes malice. Okay, it's ill will towards that source or those people or that person. Okay, and when you see them, you got ill will. What, is, what does the Bible say about that? Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use and persecute you, right? Bless them that curse you. So, so this, this is what the Bible says. So malice is not, doesn't fit in that, does it? Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use and persecute you. Malice can't fit into that. But if I got malice... I'm going to have a hard time praying for those that do something wrong to me. So 1 John 3.15. 1 John 3 and 15 says, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. Okay, so... If I hate my brother or sister anywhere in any congregation, 
But I don't deal with that. I, in God's eyes, I'm a murderer. And I'm not going to heaven. I wouldn't be going to heaven. And, and if something happens and somebody leaves a congregation because they can't deal with it to go to another congregation, you haven't dealt with it by removing yourself from the situation. Because if you did deal with it, that wouldn't cause you to move. Amen? So we can rejoice when sin is defeated, but not the sufferings of others. You've got to leave all that stuff to God. God. God knows what kind of judgment to give anybody. Okay, we don't really know. Proverbs 24, 17 and 18. And that's not always easy. Sometimes you see some people that are doing wrong and they know they're doing wrong intentionally. Proverbs 24 and 17, Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let not thy heart be glad when he stumbleth, lest the Lord see it and displease him and turn away his wrath from him. Leave it to God. You bless them. You pray for them. If you're praying for them, you're blessing them. If you're praying for God to help them, to get them to repent, to come to the Lord, to live right, you're blessing them. Amen. Anybody praying for me and help, asking me to help live for God? They're blessing me. Praise God. Amen. Envy and jealousy, these emotions are related to the bitterness, the wrath, the malice, the strife. So envy is resentment or ill will towards someone else's blessings or success. Jealousy is resentful suspicion or envy, and envy produces all types of evil. Again, when we get back to jealousy, sometimes we're not doing the, willing to do the work it takes to achieve something. God wants to help give it to us, but it takes some effort on our part. Amen. Look at James 3.16. So James 3.16 says, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. So envy produces an environment that evil can prosper in, right? Envy produces an environment where confusion comes into place. Amen. And so, again, we don't need to envy anything. God, God will give us our due portion and then some. You commit to God, you make a commitment to the Lord, and you live for him the way you're supposed to, the Bible says he'll give you what you need. Amen? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, You back up in the chapter again, and he's talking about money and clothing and housing, okay, and food. And he says, everybody's looking for those things. And God knows we need those things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, that doesn't mean you don't work. It doesn't mean you don't try to get an education. It doesn't mean you don't plan. But it does mean you put God first, and when you start the plan, you check with God to make sure the plans are what God wants for you. I'll be honest with you. You're living for God. You don't just move down to Florida because you don't like the snow. You better ask God. You better ask God. You don't just move like that because you like it, you know, or, or I want to be near Disney World or something. You better ask God. You don't just go to work for some place because that'll give you the salary you want. It's okay that you want to make money and make a certain amount you feel like you need, 
But you need to make sure that God wants you to work there, that God wants you to work at that job or situation because there's more than meets the eye. And a lot of times people, Christians, suffer many things because they do not ask God before they move. God will not override our will. But if we go off on a path that we want, God is not responsible because we chose the path. But if I stay on the path God wants me to stay on, he's going to be my good shepherd. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. A root of bitterness. Hebrews 12, 14. says, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail the grace of God. See, you can fail the grace of God. Grace is not irresistible. If it was, I couldn't fail it. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. See, a root of bitterness, okay, it, it's, it's the root. It's like dandelions. You got dandelions in your lawn, you can't just pull off the top with the flower and, and the leaves. You got to get the root or most of the root out, otherwise that dandelion grows right back. There's other plants that are like that. You've got to get the root out. So when it's talking about getting the root of bitterness out, you got to get to the source of what is causing the bitterness. And if I don't deal with my bitterness, the Bible is saying I can fail the grace of God. In other words, even though God is there trying to give me what I need, it won't be enough because I'm not dealing with the issue within me. Right? God doesn't want anybody to be lost, but we must cooperate with God. I mean, I'm, I'm amazed sometimes, you know, where you got people, well, you know, you don't have to do that to be saved. You just, you know, but it is a command, so you got to obey it. Do you think you're going to go to heaven when you didn't obey what God said to do? How does that work? Satan got kicked out of heaven for disobeying. We think we're going to go by, by disobeying? No, it's not going to work that way. It's not like stopping, shopping. If you spend enough, you build up enough points to cover it. God's not going to cover. I've got to be right with God. You've got to be right with God. Amen. Amen. So there are people that are never satisfied. They murmur. They complain. They're self-willed. They refuse to cooperate. Okay. They're busybodies, tail bearers, sowers of discord. And sowers of discord is something God hates. Did you know that? You know, we, we go over and look in Proverbs 6, 16 through 17. It says, These six things the Lord doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to him, a proud look. Some, some versions, an arrogant look, arrogant eyes, Okay. Lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. It doesn't say the Lord disli just dislikes it. It says it's an abomination. It's an abomination to God. Again, if I'm sowing discord among the brethren, I'm not going to heaven. It's not going to happen. I'm not going there. Because God hates it. It's an abomination to God. If I'm a liar, I'm not going to heaven. See that? So the Bible tells us to diligently watch for bitterness that can defile our holiness. And again, a root of bitterness is something in the heart that causes an outward manifestation. 
If we have a bad attitude, we should check for the source of bitterness in our hearts. Why? Because the Christian heart has peace, doesn't it? Right? So we look at some of these things. Psalm 119, verse 165. Psalm 119, verse 165 says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Why do they have peace? Because they love the law. Why, why, why does loving the law give you peace? <coughs> loving the law gives you peace because if I love the law, I'll obey the law. And when I obey the law, I'll be in right relationship with God, and I'll have peace. Peace. Now, when I say the law, I don't mean the Old Testament law. I mean God's laws and principles. So great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. When your heart is set on God's ways, the storm will come, and you will ride through. Disaster will come, but you'll ride through. Because that you love God, you've got confidence, faith. You've got a relationship with God. God will speak to you in the storm. You know that the storm will pass and God will be there to help you. So if I really love God's law, I want to obey God's law. Amen? Again, Romans 5 and 1. Romans 5 and 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now justified by faith, it means I believe in him, it means I, but it means I've confessed my sins. If I've got faith in God, the Bible says if I've got a sin, I need to confess it. If I've got faith, I'll confess it. If any man sin, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive them. Again, people don't realize that faith in God means I must respond. I must do what God says to do. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Lord, I feel some bitterness. I'm taking it to you. Help me. Remove it. Change my thinking. What is it in my thinking? What is it in my desires that's caused this to have a hold in me? What is it? What needs to be changed? You know, what, what are my motives and goals? Are they lining up with God? You realize if, if you're really calling yourself a Christian, your, line, your life needs to line up with God's purpose for you. Amen? That's right. God has called us with a holy calling given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. We'll read it, 2 Timothy 1 and 9. Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. If you're, if, if you're thinking as only pastors and leaders, and missionaries have to follow the calling of God, you got the wrong idea. God's got a calling for every human being. He's not just save, saving everybody and saying, well, I'll pick that one to be a missionary and that one, and this one's going to be a pastor. He had a calling for you and for me 
before we were conceived. Psalm 139, it's written in the book. Our members are written before they're formed. Jeremiah 1 and 5, I knew thee before you were conceived and called thee to be a prophet unto the nations. So every Christian, amen, we're, we're called. This is why Jesus gives these parables of, of the servant. You know, the master goes away and the servants are in the household. And he's going to come back and find out, are the servants doing what they're supposed to be doing? Know the parables? Okay, say those things. So, in other words, they're given a job. We're given a job. And it's not just going to church and reading our Bibles and praying. That's part of it. But God has got a purpose. And so, I've got to find my purpose. And so, if I'll go to the Lord and get into his purpose, I can have peace that passes understanding. If I'll get into his purpose, God will work all things together for good. So let's kind of try to summarize some of the things we talked about tonight. So living holy includes our attitudes. We need holiness with a balanced attitude, don't we? That was a couple of the other lessons we looked at. We must live according to what the Lord has directed us. We've got to find out. Okay, we've got to find out what God wants. We must strive for unity. Unity in the church. Strive for it. That means work at it. It means unity is not going to just fall out of the sky or happen. We must understand that others will grow at different rates due to the calling and understanding and allow for that. Be hard on yourself and easy on others. Expect the most from yourself. Amen? Because you know what God is expecting of you. We need holiness based on love, and we need a holiness that portrays Christian attitudes. Don't you love the Lord tonight? I love him. Let's, let's stand here tonight and thank God. Let's thank him. Hallelujah. Lord, we praise you. We thank you, Lord God. You are worthy, Lord God. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your word that's a lamp to our feet, a light unto our path. We thank you, Lord, that you're going to supply the grace and the strength and the leading of the Spirit. We need, Lord God, to accomplish these things in our lives, Lord God. You wouldn't ask us to do things that you wouldn't help us to do. Whatever you're asking, you're going to help us. You're going to give us what we need. Give us a mind to seek you. Give us faith to believe you. Give us faith to trust you with your purpose for our life. Lord, let us put ourselves into your hands and allow you to shape us by your purpose and will. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. 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 You're dismissed in the name of the Lord. Shake hands with somebody. Say, I'm glad that you're here tonight. Amen. I'm glad that you're here tonight.